Hey everyone, Duke Nuka 3 d here with another mask review in my collection, and here I have today a mask that you've probably all seen in one form or another, and that is the Chinese People's Liberation Army Type 65 gas mask, otherwise occasionally known as the FMJ-03. Now this is a mask that I really wasn't expecting to get. Uh, this is a mask that's like on my list of masks, it's like... That's a common mask that I probably should get sometime, but I really don't feel like paying for it. But thankfully, the uh, person I've gotten all my other Chinese masks off of was kind enough to send me this one completely free. So now I have one to fully analyze and kind of show off for you guys, because I know that this is uh, a lot of my you, uh, watchers are within the beginner section of collecting more or less and so this is something that was within their price range typically so i guess because these are so common it'd be great to have a review on this out there but anyhow so the type 65 was like most communist masks of the era uh derived off of the introduction of the american m17 series masks and fulfilled the desire to have a canisterless lightweight compact mask to issue to general infantry and just anyone needing to have a lightweight service mask that did not have uh, bulky canisters getting in the way of aiming or firing a rifle. And the Type 65 is quite a peculiar development because it is mostly based off of the Type 64 series masks with a few obvious additions, most notably the fact that it uses a six-point harness. The eyepieces are semi-triangular and patterned similarly to the World War II Imperial Japanese Navy Type 93 and 97 masks, and most notably of all, it has the giant honking bilateral cheek filter pouch on the left side of the mask. Other than that, all the hardware and materials are typical of Chinese masks of the era, and there is, it's interesting because you don't really hear much about China using this mask. Yes, it has been used by China quite frequently, but you see more references references to this mask being exported than you do hearing of it being used by mainland China, other than, you know, in dribs and drabs. And, and today, it is currently in use as a training mask, but I don't really know if it has much use outside of that. Um, I do know that these masks were exported en masse to North Vietnam during the Vietnam War, and it was really quite an excellent design in terms of its uh, intended users because this mask um, is about, complete with its carrier and accessories, when it's all packed together, takes up about, what well, it's about half the size of an M17 mask in its carrier. It is a very, very compact gas mask, and... It, it leaves little to wonder why the Americans were so frantic in developing the XM28 E4 mask to serve as a stopgap interim for the M17 series when it was not needed uh, to issue to tunnel rats and so on and so forth, because the M17 is quite considerably bulkier than this mask, as awkward as it looks. And then these masks only started recently getting very common in the U.S. surplus market. I know for quite a period before... Um, the, the early 2000s, it was actually quite rare to find these masks, and the reason for that is because after the September 11th terrorist attacks, uh, China started exporting a shit ton of masks to the U.S., some of which are actually kind of hard to find today because they were only exported here after 9-11, but these ones have certainly stuck around just because China has no longer a use for them. Um, but really before the early 2000s, the only way to get your hands on one of these was if you were a veteran of the Vietnam War and managed to capture one. And really outside of that, they're they're extremely hard to find. Uh, but nowadays, they're literally the most prolifically common Chinese mask on the market. And part of that fame is just due to how ridiculous this thing looks. I, it's basically just a giant tumor of a filter on the side of the mask. And it really holds no logical design. But at the same time, it's a very logical design, and it's very well engineered. It's just a very strange mask that, while well-rounded, really doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, that being said, there really isn't too much else to say about the design. I've covered pretty much all there is to cover in terms of its history, so why don't we get right down into the kit itself. The carry I have with this example is the later type with the Velcro patches to open up instead of the older Bakelite stud and rubber grommet fasteners. However, the uh, I believe this carrier is actually bigger than the older type I have with my Type 69. You can go ahead and check out my Type 69 review to get a comparison between this carrier and that one to see the main differences. Um, 
really they're the exact same carrier other than the fact that it uses a different fastener the carrier is slightly larger in dimensions and then this carrier does not have any loops on the back of it for a uh, a belt so that's a bit interesting but i guess you don't really need to fasten it onto a belt and as typical you have a thin but very very durable canvas shoulder strap and the bag itself is made out of a rugged canvas they're opening up the velcro and again i'm not really a fan of velcro on canvas carriers it seems very it seems a lot like heresy to me um, but inside you can see there is a bare minimum of things there is just the pouch for the spare voice membrane and anti-fog insert if i believe this used anti-fog inserts um but really there's nothing to see on the inside there's a couple markings there's like a number two stenciled onto there or written with with pen i can't really find any other markings in here so moving on we have this tin, which again, I believe contains spare voice membranes and or anti-fogging lens inserts. I would assume that they would be anti-fogging inserts considering that they are just about the right, that this tin is about the right diameter to, for something like that to fit inside for these lenses. Um, and then also the fact that you may notice that there's little tabs along the inside of the eyepieces which may be for retaining anti-fog inserts. But again, don't quote me on that. I'm not entirely sure. All I know is that this definitely would contain a spare voice membrane. Now onto the mask itself, which again, very common mask. I'm sure you've all seen it before, but I'm going to go a little bit more in depth than that. So here, getting a close look at the eyepieces here, you can see that they are crimped on in the typical Soviet fashion, whereas the Japanese Type 93 and 97 lenses that these are patterned off of would have been um, sort of pressed in, I believe. They weren't crimped like this. The voice diaphragm and outlet assembly is the same as the Type 64B uh, and is a very common Chinese design where you have the green rubber voice diaphragm in the center. You have a secondary outlet disc or a ring around the outside. And then you have this rubber cushion, which serves as the primary outlet valve and also retains the voice diaphragm. Very easy, a very, very well-functioning outlet valve design that I'm uh, very pleased with myself. Um, the whole assembly is secured with wire and tape covered by a rubber band to waterproof it. And much the same, the canister is retained inside of here as well. And contrary to popular belief, these filters are actually replaceable. These masks were not meant to be disposable. The only issue is because these filters are so difficult to replace, it was only done on a technical level. Uh, you had specialized technicians that were that had the hardware and the tools to replace these filters without damaging the face piece. And as such, because of the vast majority of these masks that were exported to Vietnam and the United States and possibly other countries, it gained the reputation of being a disposable mask simply because those countries that received these masks did not have access to those technicians. So they assumed that it was a one-time use only mask. But I have actually seen at least one person who's actually been able to remove the filters from inside these masks. Um, again, they're, I don't know their name and I really should have saved the photo that they had, but uh, you could probably, I think, I believe they're in the uh, r slash gas masks official discord. So if you want to peek around there, if you want, um, Anyways, the filters, again, are not uh, completely integral to the mask and are removable. The inlet valve, as you can see, bears the typical Chinese communist uh, star, and it can pull off, and you can see the expose the inlet valve, and then there is also this little plastic spacer, which, again, I'm not entirely sure what that's for. It's probably just to keep the valve from falling off or collapsing inwards or something. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, and you definitely, if you do disassemble this, you definitely want to assemble it with these little spokes pointing in towards the metal here. And you can also see the inlet of the filter itself, where it is, the, the entire filter is made out of metal, um, as for, uh, from what I remember. There is some plastic components on the inside, but other than that, the entire filter is metal. Another thing I should notice, uh, or note, is that there is an extremely rare variant of this mask that uses plastic clamps around the, uh, the voice emitter and the... Uh, inlet valve and so far I've only seen one collector that has this example and that is Bart Wilkes of gasmasks.net aka gasmasks uh, or le masque a gaz uh, and you can go ahead and check out his site if you want but yeah he, he owned the only example of this that I've seen that had plastic clamps not even the, the source that I got this mask off of claims that he's ever seen a uh, a type 65 with uh, plastic clamps so it's an extremely rare variant if you have ever come across one uh, feel free to let me know because those are very hard to find uh, moving on to the harness again it uses a six point harness very similar to the type 64 in materials but again being that it is a six point the comfort is improved the head pad is very similar in arrangement to the us m7 harness used on the m3 and m4 lightweight service masks among others 
And you may also notice that it has an additional seventh strap that retains the filter and prevents it from bobbing around and such, which is very weird. But um, and the main problem with this is that it would, it would prevent the mask from utilizing a chemical hood as one would need to undo the strap entirely to slip the hood between the filter and the face piece. Um, but other than that, it is a very secure and comfortable harness that does its job as it needs to. Uh, you have some markings down here. You have a size 2 stamp with a mold number 9. I'm not sure if the camera is able to see that, but uh, nevertheless, it is there. And I will invert the harness, or at least attempt to, and show off the interior. And again, there really isn't, isn't too much else to see. It is, again, very similar to the Type 64, but with a few minor differences. All right, uh, this is going to be rather awkward. Give me one moment here. Looking inside the face piece, uh, you can see that there is a couple stamps on the interior. You can see a number eight scribbled onto here. And then here is the date stamp, which again is a little bit faded. This might be February of 1988. It could be uh, if that's an eight and it, or if that's a two or if it's a six, it could be June of 1988 or possibly even um, uh, August of 1988. I'm not entirely sure. It's too faded to be able to really tell, but it, it all looks like eights, and this possibly is also an eight, so like I, I would be willing to bet that's August of 1988, but so I'm just going to go with that. You can see the Tissot deflectors, which are integrated with the large bilateral cheek pouch here, um, and work fairly well. They do what they need to, and you see the mold hole here and the outlet valve and voice diaphragm throughout the back there. You can also see that, like the Type 64, it has these molded bumps, these little pads next to the eyepieces to seal against the temples for a better fit. And you can also tell the little tabs around the eyepieces, which are possibly to retain anti-fogging inserts, because I doubt that China made any sort of optical inserts for this mask. Um, but that's, that's just my theory. And really, there isn't too much else to see other than that. Again, a very common mask. These are still widely available on eBay for as low as $22, and I... Probably would not have bought one myself. This one, again, I have received completely free with a package as shown in the uh, the last unboxing video I did earlier. So that being said, that's all I have to really say about this mask. It's very neat. It's very well made, um, but just sort of an odd design. Um, so that being said, I'm Duke Nigga 3 d Hope you enjoyed. If you have any comments, questions, corrections, or concerns, drop them down in the comments below, and I'll see you all later.